Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. So with me today is Trish Laub. She is an author of three books. One is Most Meaningful Life. It's about her and her dad, who she cared for. Peaceful Endings. And the one we're going to discuss today is Through the Rabbit Hole, Navigating the Maze of Digital, Digital, Dignified Caregiving. Apparently I have digital on my brain. So thanks for joining me, Trish. Thank you. So I, I've, I've kind of done both. I helped my dad care for mom while they lived in their home. And then after he died, we put her in memory care. And I feel that we were very blessed. We had an excellent community. They were, they were flexible. Mom passed away during the COVID crisis and they knew she was pretty close to the end and they called me and they said, mom's not doing well. We think she might benefit from a visit from you. So they let me basically break their 100% no visitor quarantine to come see my mom. My sister did the same day at, in the evening. She passed away the next day and there's 10 of us ended up outside her room all at once, which the poor executive director was kind of having a little bit of a, he was having an internal meltdown. <laughs> And he's like, um, um, there's too many of you here. And I said, don't worry, we're not all coming back at this point. I mean, she was gone, so it didn't matter. So I feel really blessed, but I've heard stories. I know people that are caring for loved ones at home and it's just, it's just gotta be a better way. So we also, I threw out the question to Trish because a lot of you guys have been reaching out to me on, oh my goodness, my loved one is declining faster and these stay at home mandates, what can I do? So I threw that out to her less than 24 hours ago. So, and she did come up with some, some thoughts. So we're going to discuss those too. So where would you like to start? <laughs> well, um, I guess just, I did give this a lot of thought and I want to start at the beginning. Um, okay. You know, That's always a good place. we are in, I think part of it is perspective. We are in extraordinary times. We as a human race has never seen anything like this. The closest thing we can possibly compare it to is, was from 1918. And even that was very, very different. There were far less people in the world. People weren't as global. Um, caregiving had a whole different thing going on to it. You know, somebody had quote unquote dementia and they came and lived with their family and people made sure they were safe. Things are much more complicated now with our medical system and our care system. But the fact is we live in, individual experience and now we're in this collective experience and we have stay-at-home orders and we have social distancing and wait we have no guidebook we've never done anything even close to this before so i think the first thing for caregivers is to really realize that this is unprecedented um i don't think that there is a one-size-fits-all answer for caregivers right now I don't know that there is actually advice, but I can provide some thoughts. Okay. So my first thought is that caregivers are unsung heroes. They have made a conscious choice to step up, step up to the most challenging um, opportunity, responsibility that they could, and yet it can be the most rewarding. Um, I took care of my mom and dad for two and a half years, managed their care, was a caregiver. I managed their daily care and their medical care and was a caregiver on the schedule and filled all open shifts. And I will say it was both the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life and the most challenging. And when I say the most challenging, I mean, I looked at the 54 years of my life prior to that. I had been divorced. I was a single mom. I had many things that many other people have. And I put all of that challenge together and said it paled compared to the two and a half years that I took care of my parents and yet I wouldn't trade it. So now caregiving is on steroids and I've thought about what I would do if I was in that position. So um, if you need me to like take a breath, let me know. <laughs> no, that's okay. We're doing on good. A roll here. Um, I have some <laughs> notes. So um, I read something online and I loved it. It said, don't listen to people who tell you what to do. Listen to people who encourage you to do what you know is in your heart is right. And that's what caregivers excel at. Caregivers have been doing this job. They have, they need to know and own that. 
they have been making decisions based on whatever, sometimes very limited information they had at the time and co been coming up with creative solutions all this time. The only thing that's different now is the ante has been greatly upped. So I, I would hope that they could first acknowledge what they've been doing. Yeah, That's it's a good, it's good thing to do. Times, but they've been coming up with solutions. They've been going into a medical or a care system they don't know or didn't know. And they've been figuring it out and they've been coming up with solutions. So, so I guess the first part of my thoughts is for them to acknowledge what they've been doing and own that because they, they're good at it. And, you know, they chose to do that. My second thought on that is in regard to um, Alzheimer's. Again, I read another, a woman posted, um, sadly, her dad passed while he was in a, a residential situation. And she said that she was her dad's person. She was his person. And they worked together to make his world right, comfortable and as doable as possible for him. And then tagging on to that, I read that we are the ones who make the changes and we are the ones who can make the difference. And this was in regard to dementia and Alzheimer's. Caregivers are the ones that sparkle. They enable people with dementia to not only merely survive physically, but also to survive emotionally. Focus on what they still can do, not what they cannot. And I would add the caregivers will have to be more creative now than ever before. Um, again, I want to reiterate, caregiving is on steroids right now. It Definitely. Just, beyond amplified into steroids. And in thinking about that, I thought, okay, what do I think I would have had to do, especially in regard to my dad? My mom had stage four cancer, but my dad had, uh, was living with Alzheimer's. I would, and I can go into this in more depth, I would amplify what works. I would finesse my use of language and I would adapt to change with creativity. Um, I think that's the biggest challenge is I mean, we've had to adapt our entire life and yes. the, some of the people that I know that are caring for their parent at home or their, most mm -hmm. of them are parents that I've been, people have reached out to me about. Yeah. They've had caregivers could come in and now all of a sudden, like one person, the caregiver has been able to come in. Her sister got sick. So she is on quarantine for two weeks, which means she can't go and help my mm -hmm. friend with her dad for two weeks the adult day programs are canceled. So right. it's like all of a sudden, every, yeah. everything in their life is upside down, yes. which is of course dramatically impacting the people living with Alzheimer's or dementia. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to come up with those solutions and all of a sudden from what everybody's telling me is, you know, it sounds like parents are depressed they're confused more and it's just amplifying their decline because I've had several people say this has made my dad worse or this has made my mom worse and it's like you know oh, I hope this isn't my mom's new normal and it's like oh, I'm not gonna say it I'm sure it probably is now that really sucks yeah. maybe it's not you know I think it depends on when we can start interacting and I had a guest yesterday that said you know I'm sure you've probably seen the birthday parades my yeah. husband participated in one. He's in a yeah. real uh, real estate collective here in town. Gal, had, I forgot what, what birthday, it doesn't matter what number it was, but she lives on in a court. And so they just drove down and back and honked mm -hmm. their horns and, you know, flashed their lights. And she just sat on the corner and, you know, I think it'd be kind of fun regardless, you know, <laughs> but if we didn't have this, you know, stay at home mandates, so I suggested that for her dad. He's like, well, I don't think he'd recognize anybody. I'm like, I don't think it would matter. No. If the mailman drove by and dad was sitting out front, like, hey, Joe, hi. It's just the stimulation. I think he needs the stimulation. I agree. I think there's two huge concerns I have, especially for people living with Alzheimer's. One is that they are so, um, as they're, and I hate to call it IQ, but as they're, IQ, hold on and see where the, what context I mean, diminishes their EQ, their emotional senses increase, they're heightened. So they can feel our stress. They can feel that something is wrong. And that's where I say finesse is your best friend. Um, 
we need to be really careful about how we talk about a pandemic around them. I, am, I completely am a 100%, I will never lie to anybody person. So it's not about lying. It's about stating something truthfully that allows the person to remain feeling safe. And so it's a choice of words. It's a pandemic, yes. Is it a deadly disease? Potentially, yes. But can we refer to it as a bad bug? Yes. So there's different ways. I think we need to really, really be heightenedly aware to their emotional, their ability to sense everything and feel everything that everybody around them does. My second concern is social isolation, which is ironic because we are socially isolating. But social isolation, not just for people living with Alzheimer's, the caregivers, each and me, um, they have done studies and they've proven it is as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day or having diabetes or high blood pressure. Mm. So in a way, we need to do the daily tasks, but maybe we have to switch our focus a little bit. Um, social isolation, we're going to, I believe as a country, we're going to have significant uh, PTSD from that. Yeah. You know, and in a way, you know, this is kind of a little bit off topic from the specific of, of Alzheimer's, but because of, of um, we now have people, we can't go into the senior living places. We're grieving the loss of, we're pre-grieving the loss of that ability for people who lose their loved ones while they're there. We're grieving that in a whole different way. So I think, you know, the aftermath of the pan the pandemic is one thing the recovery is going to be another. Yeah, I worry. This is today is the third today is three weeks from when mom died. This is uh, April 21st when we're recording. And it's Tuesday, Saturday morning was rough, probably because it was gloomy, kind of overcast, which mm -hmm. hello, it's California at the end of April, give me a break. <laughs> um, we went on a bike ride, cried a lot talking to my husband. And then it's, I've been pretty good. I'm feeling really good. But I know mentally that, you know, I can't go clean out her room because they don't want me there. They were mm -hmm. kind enough to let us come say goodbye. They were kind enough. They tried to let us say goodbye the day she died. You know, we all got there in like within half an hour. So it was pretty fast that she went. But I can't clean out her room. Right. And it's just basically box everything up and donate with the exception of maybe one table. Mm -hmm. I told everybody that was assembled that day take what you want don't know when we're coming back and i i feel like i'm gonna have a wa grief wave too when that happens i'm not really looking forward to that <laughs> but i and think I the opportunity as in your example of the drive-by birthday party and i've seen zoom birthday parties i think there's opportunity to collectively grieve that loss through maybe a zoom you have your people your family your friends zoom in and you can all share stories and i think we have to take some steps to do that before we're cleared to be in groups and maybe zoom doesn't work for you for that you know maybe you don't want to do a big group thing but i just saw um somebody and i don't know where you could google it and probably find it created a website for all the people who have passed away during this time that we can't properly recognize so it's an opportunity for other people to post their stories and their comments on there too so I, again, it's, it, it's adapting and being creative in the way we adapt. You know, I think we can't give, I can't give you a hug, but I can listen to your <laughs> stories. That is you true. Know, I, you know, and sadly, I know several people in that situation right now. And we just have to think outside the box and find out ways we can support each other without really being there in person. Yeah. So we are socially distanced, but we have to stay socially connected. I like the term physical distancing mm -hmm. and socially connecting because that's yes. what we need to do. Oh, I like that. That's, that's I don't cool. know about the so well, that probably isn't this physical distancing is not original. I don't know about the socially connecting is probably not I original it, either. Though. Yeah, because you know, we need to reach out and I think people who are home caring for loved ones. And they're struggling because, you know, their world was turned upside down, which is bad enough for those of us who aren't caregiving, you know, in the home or at all. But, you know, I, I know with mom, it was like there were times when 
just going to visit her felt like my world had been turned upside down. So if I was living with her through all this, it wouldn't be good. So <laughs> I can, it, it, I, you just brought up an important thing that the terminology we have set tends to say social distancing, but physical distancing is much healthier to say, or people say they're quarantined. We're not quarantined unless you think that you have COVID. We are, there's a big difference in saying we are quarantined or we are socially isolated and, and saying we're staying at home to stay safe. And those are the kinds of things when I say finessing language that are really important in explaining things to someone living with Alzheimer's. Quarantine's a scary word. Isolation yeah. is a scary word. But we are truly staying home to stay safe. So That's just true. I took the, the doggies for a walk and on my last little bit home a family cycled past me like i said husband and i are cyclists and they were all wearing masks which pretty sure is going to be a mandate to go out i know it's going to be a mandate for grocery stores i haven't read anything about our particular county and masks yet mm -hmm. but i know them <laughs> it's coming i'm sure it's coming and our masks are coming in two days and i said <laughs> is it is it yucky to ride your bike with the mask on? He goes, eh, it took a little little bit getting used to. And he goes, it gets a little warm. And I'm like, well, it's better than getting sick. And he goes, yeah, that's true. And they rode away and I went the other direction with the dogs. And so yeah. we had, you know, six feet distance, a little interaction that we probably wouldn't have had before because they wouldn't have been wearing masks. And I probably wouldn't have said anything to him, although I get stopped every 10 feet with three golden retrievers. So you never know. But I've noticed walking the dogs, there's a lot more eye contact, smiling. Yeah. There's, it just seems like a little bit more politeness. It's like, man, you guys all had it in you all this time. Yes. <laughs> and I hope that stays. I mean, it. hopefully, we have to do this long enough for it to become a habit. That's, that's the challenge. It's not real healthy to stay home all the time. But if we can stay home just long enough that we've ingrained these new habits, and we don't just immediately default back to the way we were before, we'll definitely have a better world. I agree. I think Maybe. there's a lot of opportunity in this experience. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I'm not, not wanting this experience, but once we're in it and I don't have a choice, I think there's a lot of opportunity. And one of those opportunities is for people who can't go, like you said, you couldn't go in and see your mom. And you had been, even though she was living in a residential um, a residence, a senior residence, you were still a caregiver. Mm -hmm. I mean, that job doesn't go away. And I think, you know, I tend to look at things in the most optimistic way that I can, but I think that if it had been me and I could not be, at, I would probably be living with my parents because I was one of their primary people, but let's say I couldn't, I think that I would hope that I could look at it as an opportunity to take just a few minutes more than I ever got before to take care of myself to regroup and figure out when this ends and it will end, what I could do to put myself in the best position to be able to be present again. So whether that's, you know, 15 minutes of just sitting and drinking tea, my question for people is we, the people as caregivers, the people we are caring for typically have medicine. Well, what's our medicine? I know what my medicine is, I dance. I teach a fitness class that's based on dance. So I ask people, what's your medicine? Is it tea? Is it wine? Is it walking your three golden retrievers? But and we didn't ask for this, but if we can't go visit them, we have more time. So what are we going to do with that time? Well, I answered that question two years ago <laughs> when I started the podcast. Yes, you did. See? And you created something new. I did. Well, I was looking for advice, inspiration, and stuff for myself. And when I, one second. <laughs> um, is it back? No, there we go. I can hear you. Yeah. Um, when I went looking for information, when I read, I want to read novels. Like I have, I'm on a series of their, they're about a step above young adult novel. They're, they're murder mysteries, but they're very, super lighthearted. They're almost young adult style. Yeah. I don't think they're young adult language. I don't know. That's making me sound like I'm not very bright, but they're just, they're very light and easy to read. And that's what I needed. Reading all these books mm -hmm. 
can be it, it can be a challenge there were times i'd start reading and I'm like i can't do this it's mm -hmm. a little tiny bit easier because now i don't have to apply it to my mom but i went looking for something that was easier and there was only one other podcast so i started my own because i think i must be nuts <laughs> It's but I neat. realized since mom passed away that she was a lot more in my subconscious thoughts because there was always, oh, I'm going to talk to Trish today and maybe we can, maybe she'll have some advice on whatever's going on with mom or, you know, like I can't go in and see her and her visual processing is so bad. You know, them showing her, you know, FaceTime video call isn't going to work. Although mm -hmm. somebody just said, oh, it was a gal, a past guest. Um, they've been using Skype and Skype didn't work. So she just talked to her dad on the phone and he actually seemed to like that better. So, huh? you know, maybe go back to the old fashioned methods. You never know. So I, I, I think that's one of my challenges with, with losing mom is it's like, I don't have all of that subconscious chatter about her. I, there was a lot of times I didn't think I was thinking about her that I must have been. So I think I have most on all everybody else <laughs> that's right um you will be helping everyone i think one of the hardest things for me when my my dad passed and then eight months later my mom did Ooh. and i had been 24 7 for two and a half years and i call it switching gears you don't just i mean every thought i had was about caregiving for two and a half years and then i stood there one day and thought what do i do how do I, how do I switch those gears and catch that? Like the bike chains, how do I catch that next gear? And that, I mean, honestly, it took me about a year. So, you know, it just takes time. It, it just does. Time and, and I'm, I laugh a little bit when you say, well, you know, it took you about a year because we have plans. I don't know if I told you that, you know, I, I fear a little bit about 2023 because three years ago, we, my dad was home on hospice. My oldest dog died. So my dad came home from hospice or on to hospice January 12th. The dog died January 28th. My daughter moved out February 1st. Dad died March 2nd. Mom went into memory care March 16th. Yeah, the beginning of 2017 was not fun. So 2020, we went from, no, we're not going to sell our forever home on Christmas Eve to Christmas Day. The hell with it. It's just a house. Let's jettison this overpriced house that's too big and too expensive yeah. and prepare for the my apologies world the recession they were expecting in 2021 oops sorry <clears throat> so our plan for in the next 18 months is to buy an acre of land and put two houses on it wow one for us one for my daughter and her fiance so when you say it takes a year, it's like, oh, good. I'll just do throw in some more major life changes in a year. <laughs> well, it's a process. It doesn't just, you know, take a year, but you know, it was a process to really switch gears. And when you've done something, it's no different than when you, if you quit a job you've had for a long time that, you That's know, the other thing I did this year, is I've been a photographer for almost 30 years. Yeah. I yeah. had the house that we left, had a built-in studio. It had an enormous side yard on the southwest side of the property that I had all decked out with backgrounds like this one. If you're watching the YouTube video, it looks like exposed brick. If you're not watching the YouTube video, that is. Um, <laughs> and it was very easy. And I knew if we left, it wasn't going to be, I'd have to go back to doing it the hard way. And part of me is like, eh. This is a dying industry. I don't know if I want to keep going, but it, it's been my part of my life for so long. So I got rid of that kind of too. Well, the pandemic pretty much killed the rest of it off. So it's like, okay, so every three years, we're just going to upend our life with some giant changes, all, you know, three or four changes all at once. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> Hopefully just this, this year will be the last year for that. Well, I don't have any more parents to lose. So that's at least... A positive? I don't know. It'll be interesting. So, so what kind of um, caregiver? What we we're, were going to talk about navigating the maze of dignified care. Well, um, which is a little bit. It, that's what caregivers have been doing. You know, um, my books are very much bullet point books. I'm like you. I don't 
when I was caregiving, I didn't have time to read all the books that were out there. So my books are pretty much bullet pointed. It explains, you know, it'll take a topic like, um, medical facilities and it'll explain who all the players are, are in it. You know, I don't know if you've ever been in a teaching hospital, but the entourage walks in and <laughs> no. it's like, who are you? What player, who, what, what is your specialty? This specialty doesn't know this specialty, but they have fellows and they have residents. And Oh, by the way, all those players change on July 7th every year. Note to self, don't have surgery if you can avoid it right prior to the seventh in a teaching hospital because then all of your care team changes. But anyway, um, I think it's a little bit, you know, different than the question of what you do during a pandemic. In a pandemic, you, you know, what is that called? You batten down the hole or whatever. Yeah, batten down the well, hatches. And th thank you. There we go. In a pandemic, you stay home. You keep it as small and as simple as you can. Surely, if you have to go to the hospital, you go to the hospital, but that's not the time to be researching, um, you know, s senior residences. So uh, back to the books. I'm sorry, I'm a little scattered here. Um, it's okay. They're all really bullet points. So you can go in and get one topic, three, four pages. Find out the basis of what you need. Find the 10 questions you need to walk into a senior facility or senior residence, I'm sorry, and ask as a starting point. Um, I'm a bullet point kind of girl. You can tell the way I talk. I'm just boom, 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 boom. Um, well, the 10 yeah. questions to ask when you move your loved one into a senior residence, mm -hmm. because I found out right before my dad died, he assumed mom would come live with me. I had just turned 50 and my daughter had just turned, had just turned out, moved out. I'm like, excuse me, but I have worked my butt off since I was 16 and a half. I am not giving up you know, the next 20 years of my life. Now, if I had known it was going to be three, yeah, maybe I might have, might, no, no, <laughs> it wouldn't have worked. And then she, I don't, she got very combative at the end. That's, mm -hmm. that's how she ended up falling and breaking her leg. But I didn't ask a lot of questions. They did answer them. They did a very good sales job, but sure. the place was convenient mm -hmm. to me. It wasn't as convenient to my sister, but she lives out in the freaking boonies. And they said she could keep her dog and it was like That's here's okay. money here's the deposit <laughs> sure like, where where do you want me to sign and um, and i mean i i think i went in on gut instinct and mm -hmm. like i said earlier they were fantastic they they put up with the dog for 18 months until they renovated and she was getting quite nutsy because she did not have structure and my sister and i had been kind of debating the dog was grossly overweight. She was almost double what she should have weighed. Mm. And we lost the battle of the med techs feeding her because the dog was smart enough to know that if she got locked in the room during meals, she wasn't going to get fed from the residents. So we mm. lost that one. What's really super annoying to lose that battle to a, what should have been a 16 pound poodle. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. She weighed 28 when we moved wow. her out. Wow. So yeah, she was beefy, but you know, so they, they didn't ever ask me to rehome her. My sister and I were like, do we do it? Mom doesn't seem invested in the dog, but sometimes she does. You know, it was just one of those, you never know. It's it, never a good time to decide, right? So the, the executive director is like, well, you know, um, we're renovating. And I'm like, uh, yeah, the uh, scaffolding and the paint and the trucks and the dumpsters where my parking used to be. Yeah, I, yeah I've got that. Well, you know, about the dog, uh-huh. Well, you see... You know, we're going to be putting in new carpet. He beat around the bush so hard it was hysterical. I'm like, so you would like Misty to be rehomed? Well, I don't really want to ask that. I'm like, no, but that's what you want, right? <laughs> and that's how he was when 10 of us ended up in the memory care the day mom died when they wanted zero. So, you know, and he never said, oh my God, you know, you people, we got to get out of here. Get, 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 go, 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 go. Go in the parking lot. No, he was really kind. So I... I don't know what angel was sitting on my shoulder that said, this place will be good. It'll be fine. But I seriously, I didn't, I didn't vet. I didn't yelp. I didn't do anything. Well, but you, so having 10 story, questions would have been very useful. Because your story is so, such a great example of what caregivers do. They look at the whole situation, say, you know, it's not really going to work for them to move here, probably. You have to look at so many decisions to decide whether someone can stay in their home. 80% of the people in the country want to live their lives out of their home. 20% do. Part of that is that they didn't plan, and part of it is that it isn't realistic with considering 
your life, your family's life, your sister's life, the finances, the logistics, all of those things. And there is no one right answer, but there are things to consider. And then you also adapted, you figured it out. She went there with a dog and then it wasn't realistic. And then you, this, there aren't concrete, this is why I think even in, in regards to your question today, there are not one size fit all concrete answers. There are considerations and questions to ask. And your gut told you, and I am pretty sure, actually I'm positive, had there been problems there, you would have known it and you would have addressed the problem, even if that meant you moved her. So yeah, our Yelp reviews helpful sometimes, our personal referrals helpful a lot of the time. The one quirky little thing I recommend to people that they always look at me like, what? I always say eat a meal there. Because the biggest complaint that I have heard from people leave, living in senior communities is they don't like the food. Oh, and great food, food where becomes she was at. increasingly important as people get older. It's one of the things they can still taste and enjoy and it brings them comfort and it brings them memories. So ask to eat a dinner there or a lunch. You know, it sounds crazy and unimportant, but it becomes important when they become dissatisfied there. It's crazy, but it's true. <laughs> I, and I, I don't think it's that crazy. I don't, I don't think I had a meal with mom before we moved her in. Pretty sure I didn't. Because I knew the situation that my sister and I had quasi decided on mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, my sister and I do not see the world at all in the same lens. Don't see it ever the same way. And we had come to pretty much an agreement. We needed to, to loop in a couple other people and have some more conversation, but we were on the same page, which is like a freaking miracle. <laughs> and then, you know, my brain that never seems to shut up was, you know, one day I was like, okay, well this scenario that we're discussing, okay, absolute worst case nuclear option if if the worst stuff happens then what and it and i kind of role played it in my head and i said nope not gonna work mm. and so i jumped off the page that my sister and i had managed to get on <laughs> now thankfully the person we were going to loop in was not interested in what we were, were discussing yeah. so that made it a little bit easier but i had already gone to the community and checked it out and my sister went in with different emotions which didn't surprise me and what i did like there is i don't remember the first time i had a meal with her there but i did they had a huge um like a thanksgiving buffet which was hysterical because her friend ate three desserts and she'd be like oh i don't think i've had dessert and she'd have a third one it was like no yeah. stay skinny when you've had three desserts i just look at them and i've gained weight but their food <laughs> the was of age Oh, well, okay. Something to look forward to then. <laughs> <laughs> I told you food gets more important when you get older. <laughs> and it got to the point where there was, you know, my husband and I are Rotarians. Mondays, were, I'd go to see mom after Rotary meeting on Mondays. And occasionally we don't have a meeting for whatever reason. I mean, we don't have them 52 weeks a year. And late last fall, I was like, I really need to have a meal. I don't remember the last time I actually sat with mom in her residence and had a meal. And I need to because I think she's having challenges with eating. And I had no problems with eating with hands. You know, you want to eat the pasta with your hands? I'm fine with it. It's a little challenging. You know, finger foods would be better. And it was, it was good because she was having struggles. Mm -hmm. And there were times when she didn't have problems and there was times she had significant problems. So it was like, can you pick a, pick a plate to land on here, lady? Because I can't figure out how much help you need and, and what I need to help you know, provide the caregivers to help you. And so it was constantly, the last 10 months was a, I felt like I was chasing my tail. I was never caught it because it was like, okay, we had lunch together. You struggled a little bit. It was okay. And then the next week we had lunch together and it was a disaster. Yeah. So, and, you know, I think eating with them is important. And if you do that before you move them in and you realize, oh, the food tastes like crud, their food was excellent. Small, small portions. Yeah. That's not always the case. Well, we were and lucky. it's not the most important thing, obviously, but you know, I think what's really important, even I always say you have to make the best decision you can with the information you have on any day, 
You that can always kind of change true. that decision. It's not optimal sometimes, but the real important thing is like you to continue to go there at different times unannounced to, you know, just show up and see what's going on. You know, that that's where you find out what's happening. It was always that's funny when I would show up early mm -hmm. They'd be like, Oh, you're early today. Oh yeah. We don't have rotary today. So I'd end up like two hours, two and a half hours earlier. Yeah. Or I would do some errands after Rotary and I would end up an hour later and they'd be like, oh, we were wondering if you were coming today. So they knew when to expect me and it always threw them off when I didn't show up at basically two o'clock on Mondays. But the element of surprise is your friend. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it was more like, you know, they never seemed like, you know, we'd, we'd polished up and you didn't show up for yeah. two hours or, oh no, you're here two hours early. Quick, sweep the, sweep the bad stuff under the rug. It was, it was always just because it was so consistent that when it wasn't, it was, it was kind of dramatic, not dramatic in like a, it was just, it was very obvious when the schedule changed. So. But there's something nice about them knowing your schedule as well, but with the surprise changes, because then, you know, if they're, expecting you then maybe there there's something that they want to tell you then or you know there's a, a good side to that as well that is true they they always i always tried to get there because i think they've switched um staff at 2 30 so mm. i tried to make sure not to get there at 2 30 either mm. show up at 2 or show up at 3 but not at 2 30 but i tried to get there before shift change because the gal at was responsible for mom's showers and dressing. And she was always the one that was telling me what my mom needed. Mm -hmm. um, if she didn't see me before she left, then I'd get a call the next day. And I'm like, I was just there. You could have told me she needed toothpaste yesterday. No, now it's a pain in the butt. Yesterday would have been easy. Now it's a pain in the butt. So, you know, that they, they do try to make sure to talk to you about stuff like that. But she was, it was funny because when, you know, mom broke her leg and she was bed bound because she couldn't put weight on it. You know, I'm thinking about the big picture, the care, the, you know, medical, the healing, blah, blah, blah. And this gal who, you know, did a wonderful job taking care of mom. She's like, you know, your mama need more night, um, nightgowns. Um, what did she call those? Um, house coats, which made me laugh because yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's like not a term we use, but that's okay. Oh, that's a throwback. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. And she was, she couldn't have been as old as me. She was probably in her forties. Um, so it's like, yeah, you know, I was like, okay, house coat. My, my mom didn't even refer to him like that. Yeah. So, and it didn't, it didn't occur to me that mom would need, you know, something they could just pull over her head. And, and she said, oh, well, you know, get her some dresses too for, you know, down the road. And when I was shopping, that was the most surreal experience. This was right before the shutdown. And I go into JCPenney's and the place is deserted. And it took me like three times as long because the, the gal in the, um, you know, the, intimates department i think she was bored for wine and she was older she was older than me i think she's actually older than my mom and she's like i have never seen this store this dead and i'm like no this is this is really weird well, and <laughs> you know and, and see that was saturday yeah monday was when the lockdown happened so it was just it was crazy and i had debated i'm like i'm mentally stressed i don't really know i i bought three nightgowns and some slippers and a, a jacket you know, bed jacket. And I'm like, I can't, I can't contemplate dresses right now. My mom wasn't a dress person mm -hmm. and I'm glad I didn't bother because they would never have gotten used. Mm -hmm. I mean, somebody would have gotten nice donated brand new dresses, but you know, <laughs> but she was always the ones like, you know, your mama need this, your mama need that. Oh, okay. Oh. Yes, ma'am. I'll go get those. <laughs> That's very sweet. Yeah. She was wonderful. And I will, I'm going to go back. I went about a year ago, maybe a little more than a year ago with my youngest golden and mm. took him to visit with the ladies. And oh my goodness, he had a great time. The women loved it. Yeah. So we're going to, I'm going to bring him back because there's some caregivers I didn't get to see that day. Right. You know, and, and so it, that's the other thing is it's like, oh, I, I just realized that there's like about a half a dozen people that are now also out of my life because mom's gone. It's like, Oh, this is crazy. <laughs> it's right. like, you know, these things you don't expect to have to navigate. <laughs> well, and honestly, the, the caregivers and the residents is this is on steroids for them in a whole different way. I mean, they lose people 
and you can't even clean the room out. I mean, they, and they don't get to see you. And yeah, it's, this is just a. Well, they were supposed to have an event at the community in March. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why they had such a hard time pulling it together. Cause I kept saying, can you give me a date? It was supposed mm -hmm. to go to Denver 18th through the 21st. I'm like, I don't want to buy a plane ticket for you people to tell me, oh yeah, we're going to have our thing on the 20th or the 19th. Cause that'll just make me crazy. Please don't make me crazy. It's already enough crazy going on. And obviously they had, they never got it scheduled. They were supposed to schedule it for April. That didn't happen for obvious reasons. So I will go back. I do want to still be part of the community. You know, I'm still, I feel like now I'm a caregiver to caregivers. So I've, I have wow. been promoted <laughs> and, you know, and it's like, I still have to go and clean out our stuff or at least box it up so it can be donated. But it must be weird because they took apart her bed and stored it. Mm -hmm. And then the hospice people came in with the hospital bed and all their stuff. So the hosp all the hospice equipment is gone. So it must be really weird because it's like mm -hmm. some of her stuff is there and some of it's not. It's just, they probably just walk by the closed door, which probably still has the wreath on it, the spring wreath. Mm -hmm. Crazy. It's just, yeah, like you said, it's all on steroids. You know, and I think when they called me and said, mom's not doing well, one of the comments the gal made was, you know, we miss you guys too. You know, it's like, hello, you know, we get to come to work and look at our coworkers and basically all your crazy parents. Right. So it's definitely, well, definitely it's hard. I'm using you as the example. There again is something that's really, really, I think important. If you're going to put somebody you love into a senior residence where they are receiving care. I mean, you can be in a senior residence where it's independent living, but even there it's important. I think it's really important to get to know the people that you are trusting with their care. Know their names, say their names. There's nothing more valuable to a human being than their name. So you get to know them and they get to know you. And I honestly think that makes a difference. The one thing I always tried, and I think it's because I witnessed the opposite behavior was I always thought that they were part of mom's team. It was, mm -hmm. you know, the people we were paying. Yes. And everybody knows those places are not cheap. Yes. And my sister and I and our husbands and the grandchildren and my, um, my mom has three siblings. One of them's three hours away. And then, so her, the younger of the two brothers brought her sister who they're the basically numbers three and four. My mom was the oldest. Hmm. number two lives three hours away so number three and four would come over you know it's about a 40 or so minute drive you know on a good day he would bring the sister over so that was the team yes. and my goal was not to make things worse not to demand that they do something mm -hmm. not that they not you know hey can you oh you're oh you guys are serving dessert can i have one too i mean i would ask politely or i'd go over there and ask it's like they're not here to take care of me no matter how much money we're paying them they're not here to take care of me and i always tried to find like a win-win or find the solution to the to the problem you know taking er, taking the whole team into account because like the executive director i don't think that guy could get paid enough money because you know the residents complain the families complain i'm sure the staffs complain it's Absolutely. like whoo you know, I mean, and then right now it must be just a complete nightmare. And, right. and, you know, we're asking people in senior residents to do a job, a level of a job anyway, that we are saying we can't do mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. And that's okay to do that, to say that. But I think it's really important to, you know, if there are problems, you have to address them, but address them in a win-win way. But also just to really be grateful for what they're doing and let them know that. that we know from the, the kind of caregiving we've done, it's a hard job, mm -hmm. one of the hardest jobs. And so, you know, we might think, oh, you were paying all this money and they, this is their job and they have to do it. That is true, but there's an and to it. And I am grateful for that. I think too many people forget really that and part. Think that if you are respectful, you know their name, you thank them for when they've done a great job, you bring attention to something exceptional or extra they've done to their boss, there's no doubt that your loved one gets maybe some more attention. Yeah, they're I mean, always telling me, oh, mom was so easy and now she's not easy. I'm like, 
You know, she wasn't easy when we were teenagers, right? This is not necessarily abnormal for personality. It's just personality on steroids. Well, I think personality, I think with memory loss, it, it, it amplifies for a lot of reasons. So yeah, I'm drew blood on some of these caregivers. So when I'm allowed to go back in, I'm trying to figure out what to do because you're not supposed to tip them. And I will probably, I'm going to put them, I got to remember this. They're, they do, you're allowed to put money in a communal tip Yes. at the holidays, which is a long way off from right now, I think. <laughs> I will do that then too. So, but I, I want to make sure that the, the ones that were really hands-on at the end, I want to do something for them, but I don't know how to do it yet. So that's in the back of my brain. You know, my parents didn't live in a senior residence, but they were in medical facilities. And when they were there any amount of time, we figured out what was appropriate to the group. We got to know the nurses and the CNAs and all of that. Um, you know, sometimes we brought them food and, you know, cards that we signed and wrote things in. Um, I think there was some sort of communal, I think we, we gave them money, but it had to be split to the group or something, or the group could choose to do something. I would think that if you hand them a personal card and ask them not to open it till they're home, I mean, I'm not suggesting we violate their rules, but you know. I thought about buying scrubs. There's a company online that you can, I guess they're supposed to be really soft and, mm, nice. and excellent. And I'm going to have to look up the name again, but they also, when you buy a set of scrubs from this company, they also donate it to medical professionals that have need. So I'm like, that's a serious win-win and scrubs aren't really cheap. So yeah, I'll have to look that up. Yeah, I'm if I remember to, if I remember the name, I'll I'll email it to you. <laughs> well, I'm trying to figure out something to do at our local hospital that has a COVID ward, just to kind of maybe perk them up a little bit. Yeah, supposedly these are really soft, and they're, for the lack of a better term, modern. I, yeah. I'm trying to remember the commercial in the back of my head, but it's like fit is better, pockets are better. There's, it's just mm -hmm. they've updated them so they're better. From what you know, of course, with the commercials. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if you think of it, let me know. <laughs> I will try to remember to Google it. So, so is there any navigating the maze of dignified care for people that are at home? We kind of touched on it a lot with the how to deal with all the insanity of our life right now. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just so very different right now. And I think the best thing, yeah, I actually, I'm going to look at some notes because I, I wrote down a couple things that I thought might Again, if I was still with my dad, um, I think it's more important now than ever to stick with what works, successful routines. Um, amplify what works, what has worked in the past. Um, I mentioned, I touched this a little bit. Avoid, really, really try to be conscious of language, use of language. Avoid words that can cause anxiety because even if it didn't cause anxiety before, they're much more susceptible to the emotional charge of how you might word something. It takes an extra second to turn that switch on and say, okay, wait, how do I want to phrase this so that it helps them continue to feel safe? Um, adapt to minimize social isolation. We've kind of hit that on the people, um, on the topic of senior residences. They're using Zoom. Um, the same thing applies inside your home. They're cut off. Maybe you're the only caregiver. They're cut off from the, anybody else on the outside. Again, Zoom, FaceTime, Skype. You can, depending on where someone is in their process, if they can still watch movies, you can use Netflix to do a, a movie party where everybody watches it at the same time. There are unbelievable amounts, and I'm not you know, promoting myself, but if you go to trishlaub.com backslash resources, there's a section at the top and I've started putting links to things that are free that you can stream. So operas, ballets, you can take virtual museum tours, you can take virtual field trips. Everybody, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber is allowing you to, to stream his musicals. So bringing that into your home is, even though the streaming is still not some of it's not live, but it's because it was live performances, it's more tangible. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So fight the social isolation, um, you know, adapt there. I know we don't have time. I get it. But we're not leaving the house as much as we used to. Self-care. 
If you can do 15 minutes of sitting in a room by yourself with a cup of tea, it's invaluable. Much, I mean, it's always important, but much more so now. And the other thing is I have found with my, my dad with Alzheimer's, my mantra was you are loved and you are safe. Repeat that mantra. You are loved and you are safe. But as a caregiver, especially now, you need to say it to yourself. That's a good point. You, you really need to get the negative talk out of your house, out of your house, out of your head. Caregivers are doing a job equally different in a different way to healthcare providers. We are fighting for these people. And I don't like the word fight in regard to caregiving on a day-to-day -day basis. We have challenges. No, we're actually fighting for these people right now. That is true. Just as the caregivers. And that will ease off. That's, I think that's a, something else I really want to say to caregivers. We didn't expect it. We didn't want it. It's caused fear, anxiety, and frustration. We've had challenges like we never would have anticipated. But this is going to end. We just need to hang on. There's, there's a, um, somebody had said, we're all in the same boat. And then somebody else came out on you know, social media and said, no, we're not. And that is true. We are not. But we're all in the same river. And we can fight the current or we can flow with it. And trust me, the flow is going to be a whole lot easier. And part of that, I think, is, is trying as hard as it is to let go of the consciousness that this isn't going to end. It is. I don't know when. But we're going to get through it. And there's people like you doing podcasts to help them. There's people like me talking to you. And, you know, I just, I think it's really important for people to know that I don't know hundreds of thousands, I don't know, millions of the caregivers in this country, but I'm thinking about all of them. I'm willing to do what I can to help. And I'm cheering them on because, man, this is tough. Yeah, it's the messages I've gotten are, I don't want to say heartbreaking, but it's, you know, it's like, I'm so glad I'm not in the middle of trying to take care of my mom at home and our whole routine has been upended. Yeah. She was enough challenge as it was. She didn't think she needed help. That's why she got combative because the more help she needed, the more she resisted. So that was getting to be ugly. And I'm really glad we kind of just cut that off. We had about six months, maybe eight months of combativeness and then mm -hmm. now we're done you know it's like because i kept thinking i don't know how we're going to handle this when it gets worse and, ooh, you know so i got lucky on that front but you know it's scary when you think you know my mom has declined and we and she's not going to get better just when the the, so, the socialized programs the social programs open back up or you know i think i think people will they might they might decline a couple of steps. They might come back half a little bit. I don't think they'll come back all the way, but I like the streaming. I've had people say, oh, you know, dad doesn't engage with that, which my mom wouldn't have either. But I'm wondering if, you know, if like, oh, God forbid I played opera for my mom, that wouldn't have gone over well. But if your parent was into opera, your spouse or Andrew Lloyd Webber, that probably would have been better for my mom. Just streaming it because it's so rich and you know, it kind of does something to you. So it might be worth trying because, you know, they've got the visualization that they can kind of connect with on and off, but the, the music playing, you know, we have an 85 inch TV. I let my husband do that when we moved and it's been a blessing for some, uh, some zoom socializations. We're doing a zoom, uh, what we call TGIF, uh, you know, for our rotary club, um, for, you know, obviously on Friday, um, there's, there's Zoom games you can play with people. That's obviously not an option for people with memory loss. But you know, when you have an 85-inch TV and you're talking to your friends that are just over there on the other side of town, you know they're kind of life size, and it's kind of nice. So I think care residents should definitely invest in smart TVs. I may actually send an email to the director of Mom's Memory Care and see because when they renovated. I don't know if they change the TV or not. And if it is a smart TV, they might want to consider, you know, when you do the FaceTime call, air, air play it to the TV so right. that like, if I think if my mom could see me big, it might've helped, although yeah. she was in a hospital bed. So that's, that was a challenge too. You know, it's just, you just gotta kind of keep looking for yeah. 
any kind of, even if it's a half a solution is better than no solution. Well, my aunt is in West Virginia and the other day, it's a little bit more of a remote area, but the other day people who had horses brought the horses and they walked them to every window. So the residents can see it. We just have to think, come up with a crazy idea and see if it makes sense. You know, try, I mean, we have to think outside the box. We got to figure out different ways to do things. And you mentioned the music. Um, you know, there may be a style of music that the person doesn't enjoy, or maybe there are old CDs that you have that you can actually play CDs for them. My dad, my dad, I put on old music from the forties and he knew every word to every song. It was bizarre, but music is the one thing that activates every center of your brain. Mm -hmm. So it's huge hugely therapeutic, hugely helpful um, for people, especially with memory loss, to hear music. See, my mom so, was into talk radio back in the 80s. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, if she was me, this, you know, back, you know, fast forward 40 years, she'd probably love podcasts like I do. I listen to music too, but I listen, I like to listen to people, other people talk mm -hmm. because it helps shut my brain off. And I think she would have liked that. And I wish I had come up with a way for them to just stream my podcast to her. Like at night when she was in bed, just, you know, just she could hear my voice. And that would have probably, it would have wow. been something I would have worked harder at had she not passed away just to keep mm -hmm. that connection. I don't know if it would have helped, but it would be worth trying. Yeah. You know, and I think trying to find a solution is just as beneficial for us, you caregivers, as it is mm -hmm. to actually finding one. Yes, yes. If you, if you find, you know, if you keep trying, you know you've done the best job you can, and if you come up with stuff that's mm -hmm. working, that's even better. When you just said something I think I, I'm a big believer in is that I think as long as you do your best every day, then you won't have regrets. People would say, how did you go through two and a half years without regrets? I didn't do everything perfectly. Man, some days my best was bad. But I could walk away and say every day I brought my best game. Another thing I want to say really quick is we're, we've been talking about like group Zooms, which I think are great. They, they fulfill one thing. But what I love with my aunt in West Virginia is I schedule Zoom calls. So my aunt knows, they can tell her, oh, your niece is calling on this day. So she, it becomes something they can look forward to. Um, so, I mean, I think if somebody is at home providing care and they have family members outside of the house, maybe they could, simple thing they could do is make a schedule for phone calls. So not everybody's on one day or it's two a day or it's one a day or whatever. It becomes something that can be looked forward to. They can even put the schedule up on the wall to show that person. So, like I say, there's limitless ideas. Just people need to let the ideas come. I think it, I think you just have to not be afraid to try them. I mean, if you try and they fail, you've tried. Move on. Yeah, um, I tried a lot of things with my mom because at the end, I I'm pretty sure she had non non. Let's see. Her late stage symptoms were not typical mm -hmm. and because she walked and talked till the day she died, except, well, not the walking so much because she broke her leg, but she would have. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And that's not typical. And so it was very easy to, when you're in it and you're so close to trying to help her mm -hmm. to not see the forest for the trees for lack of a better <laughs> sappy analogy. And you know, now that I look back, it's like, cause my husband's like, I don't know why you didn't think she, that this wasn't going to be the year. And I'm like, cause her mother had Alzheimer's and died at 91. Now my grandmother didn't get Alzheimer's until she was my mom's age. My mom started 20 years ago. So that makes a huge difference. And we'd always said, you know, we rented out her house and my dad had investments and it was like, we have to make sure this money lasts because if it runs out when she's in the the very, very last stages and she has to move in my house, that's not going to be pretty. I don't want that. And I've right. seen that happen to other families. They run out of money and they have to move their loved one home when their loved one needs phenomenal amounts of care. Right. So that was my, always my thought process is taking care of mom until the very end. And I just didn't expect the end to be where it was, but I tried all kinds of things. And I, when she broke her leg, 
I was like, okay, I am 99% certain this woman's not walking again. She's not going to do the physical therapy, you know, and even if she, even if we did do the surgery, which wasn't really a smart idea, you know, she needed physical therapy one way or the other. I'm like, she's not going to be walking. So I had already, I had already envisioned outings with the wheelchair. I'm like, she loves to watch kids. We will be able to go and get closer and, you know, it'll actually be better. (sighs) Oh, well. I think, you know, you brought up really, you always bring up really important points. One is that I don't think that people realize the average life life expectancy for someone with Alzheimer's is between 10 and 20 years. Now, there are people who live one year, but maybe it's due to another pre-existing, I don't know. But the other thing that's really interesting is, and I heard this early on when my dad was diagnosed, Maria Shriver said that one of the people taking care of her father had said, if you've seen one case of Alzheimer's, you've seen one case of Alzheimer's. There is no typical. My dad, I wrote my story about my journey with my dad because it was anything but typical. The last time he was conscious, four days before he passed, he knew each of my sisters and I, my mom, and said something of specific relevance to each of us. Interesting. He was at least 20 years into it. So, I mean, he was still articulate. Um, so there is no typical. And I didn't write my, the books that I've written to say that this is Alzheimer's for everybody. It's just to say if it can be that way or the way it was for your mom, for one person, then it can be that way for somebody else. So. My goal is always try to find a tidbit. You know, we, we throw out a lot of ideas and we talk about a lot of different things. And if people go away with one thing, like I'm going to try this thing Trish said, because Jennifer said, just try it. <laughs> it's like, amen. I'm with yeah. you right there. That's all we need to do. Just, one tip. you know, yeah. It and, can make and, all the difference in your day. That is true. And if it does, like I said, if it doesn't work, You've tried, I looked at videos and photographs of my mom from the last two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And I went to sleep knowing that I did a great job. I did the best I could. And trust me, there was a couple of times at the very end, like you said, the best was not very good. (laughs) And my husband feels a little guilty because his last encounter with my mom was negative. She did not want to get off the x-ray exam table or, you know, the x-ray table. And he's always been super good with her. And so I called him and I said, can you please come sweet talk mom off the, off the table? That sounds really bizarre. And so he tried Right. and he reached his hand out to her. She was ticked off at all of us. Cause I tricked her on in onto the table. And so I just basically, I left her vision, her line of vision cause she was mad at me and I had to drive her back. So I'm like, I'll just let everybody else deal with her. Maybe yeah. she'll forget she's mad at me. Well, he reached his hand out to her to say, Oh, come on, mom. Let's, let's get the heck out of here. Yeah, you're right. These people are all, she kept calling them assholes. You people. Yeah. These people are all assholes. Let's go. And she scratched the crap out of him and it hurt and it drew blood. And he was like, he picked her up and plopped her into the wheelchair and he was steam was coming out of his ears and words he doesn't normally use were coming out of his mouth. And it was like, Oh, this is not good. And he was like, yeah, I love it. My last interaction with your mom, she called me an asshole. And I'm like, well, you know, she didn't really feel that way. <laughs> That's just one moment in time, you know. And he can laugh about it, but it's, you know, it's still a little ding on the heart when you're like, geez, you know, I was always really good with her. And that was my last encounter. It's like, bummer. I'm going to say, but she knew what he did for her. Yeah, I mean, it's sad that that's the last encounter, but she knew that and she wasn't herself. And I'm not excusing it. It's not okay, but, you know. It's hard. I know it is, but you know, it's like in that moment, it was like, lady, there are people waiting for this exam room, get off the table. Right. And it was frustrating and she's swearing at everybody and calling everybody names. And it's just, the whole situation was just, it was negative. And you know, she played, she picked the wrong day to, to upset him. And it's like, it's, I just told him, I'm like, think about all the other times when I was about ready to just choke her. Mm-hmm. And the two of you just got along like friends. And he's like, I've always been good with old ladies. <laughs> so. but you know, we all do the best we can and we have limits. And That is true. And That's- even within those limits, if we do the best we can, and as I said, some of my best days were not good. And we're, I think caregivers are going to have more of those right now because we're just in these crazy times. And I would like to wor- retire the word unprecedented. <laughs> I know. But it is, I mean, I really think that is true, but yeah. 
It is, but when, when 2021 rolls around, we're going to come up with a new word. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, we're here where we are in the middle of the river floating down it, so we just got to, and we're going to hit some rapids, that's for sure. But once, and, you know, we got to stay on the day we're on. We have to stay on the day wrong? On the day we are on. Oh, day we are on. Okay, I'm like, that didn't make any sense. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> The day we are on, I'll articulate, and not look too far forward. Just deal with where we are on the day. Yeah. All we can do. Tomorrow's going to be different. I don't know how. Maybe hopefully better. Take it one day at a time. Well, that sounds like a great place to end, and I really appreciate it. And Trisha's books are all linked in the show notes, so you guys can finish listening to this and click over and grab that. And make sure you look at her website to the resources, because that sounds great. And just, like she said, do your best, because that's all we can do. I hope I've given somebody one tip. <laughs> I'm sure you have. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.